Hey, thanks guys for watching today. This is the first Sunday of April and we're so glad you're here with us today. We just had Easter Sunday last week. A lot of people go to church or maybe even watch online, but uh, hey, church keeps going on every Sunday, right? So I'm glad you remembered that and here you are. It's not even Easter and you're watching. So that's awesome. So we're glad you're here with us today. What we're going to do is have a time of worship. We're going to have a time where we pray, a time where we give to God. And we're going to hear from his word. We're going to celebrate communion today. We're just expecting God in all of these aspects of our service to really meet us and speak to us today. So we invite you to join in. Hey, center in. Like, don't do this while you're doing something else. Really focus in. Uh, sing when we sing, right? Give when we give. Pray when we pray. Um, and open your heart up for what the Spirit wants to say to you. Celebrate communion when we talk about it at the end. Get ready, in fact. Have something ready that, that you can use to represent the body and blood of Christ. Just fully enter into this moment. And let's believe that God can meet us here as we turn our attention to him. So are you ready? Let's come together and let's meet with God in this moment.
Hey, you know what? Um, Sometimes all you have to do is watch the news to see how broken our world is, to see how people talk to each other, to see the chaos that happens um, in the world, uh, to see the helplessness that we're in to do anything about it. I think about that as I look at the situation in Haiti right now. Having been to Haiti five, six times and done relief work there, it actually grieves me greatly to see the chaos, the destruction, the pain, the hurt that that nation is experiencing. And... Um, it just it just speaks to me so much about the state all of us are in that if left to ourselves, um, we can't fix our own problems, that, that we are in a desperate state um, and that we desperately need to reach out from God. We're going to talk about that today, that that realization so we, um, that that we need God, <laughs> that we are broken is, is really a part of an important part like uh, of our living our life. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end with hopelessness because it opens us up to the other side of the equation where God can enter into our life, that he wants to dwell with us. That as we turn to him out of our desperation, he meets us in his power and his presence. So whatever situation you're facing today, it might feel very desperate. It might feel like you have no hope. Um, it might feel like all is lost. I want to challenge you to bring that sense of desperation to God, to pour out your heart to him, to look to him as the only one who can solve your situation. And that as you do that, as you approach him in that way, that he will show up, that he will show up and show off in your life today. Can we pray together in this moment and ask God to do that? God, we thank you so much for um, the fact that Though life gets very desperate, it is not hopeless because you are always there. In fact, many times in that moment of desperation, you're waiting for us to simply open up and admit something you already know, that we desperately need you, that we can't fix our own problems. Much like we look at the at nation of Haiti and see in there a microcosm for all of humanity that, that this is what happens, that we are helpless to solve our own problems and that we can quickly descend into chaos and destruction. So we reach out to you today, God, in our life and ask you to show up and show off. We admit your need, our need of you today and reach out to you. And while we're praying, we pray for the nation of Haiti, uh, for the people there, God, who feel a sense of desperation like most of us watching this will never, ever have to live in. And we pray, God, for you to show up strong and powerfully, God, in a way that will redeem the destruction, the devastation that has been caused by man and will show what you, what the loving, powerful God can do. Thank you for that, Lord. We pray and ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So trust God in whatever you're doing today, believing that in whatever you're facing, that he can meet you powerfully as well. I want to challenge you as well to, to give to God in this moment. Um, you know, we just prayed and asked God to give to us in our sense of desperation. But, you know, it's a good thing for us to give back to him as a way of saying thanks to him so that we're not just takers in our life, but we're also being like God in that we're giving. You know, we're asking him to give to us. It's only fair that we in turn should give in response to what, he has done in our life. So you can go over to greenwall.evangelassembly.org and you can, you can go there and we have a give menu, a give button, and you can pick different things to give to. Since we're talking about Haiti today, you can even go in a mission section and give specifically to missions work that Evangel does all around the world. And please know that as you give, God takes your gifts and brings the hope um, that people in desperation need. Uh, whether it's the hope that, that that we are able to distribute through our food pantry or through spiritual counsel that people come to us for help when their life falls apart, or whether it's what we're able to bring around the world um, as we take mission trips, as we support missions. Either way, what you give makes a difference. What you give helps people know in their desperation that there is hope. Thank you so much for your gifts today. We're going to continue on in our service and we're going to continue to reach out to God and expect him to meet us as we pray, worship, and look to his word today.
Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray.
that's some good news. Marriage involves two people. They meet. You found me really attractive, really quickly. <laughs> they fall in love. She's passionate. <laughs> They get married and embark on a relationship that's designed to be one of increasing intimacy. I really couldn't see my life without her. But that's not automatic. We have to keep working at our marriage. Because I wasn't getting much affirmation, I started getting that from other places. Our marriage was nearly over. If you start building good habits in your relationship, you'll be reaping the effects of those choices in five, 10, or 20 years time. I can't let my past define my future. We have to build our own reality. The aim of the marriage course is to strengthen the connection between you as a couple. Love grows us. This is not a silly sentimental idea. This is science fact. How about one that we don't really hear about? How about this one, fun? Marriage ought to be fun. If you're not having fun, what's the point? The marriage course is built on universal principles that are relevant to any couple anywhere. In years to come, you'll look back on having built a marriage as perhaps the most important achievement of all in your lives. Some good news. Hey everybody, uh, welcome. I have a little challenge for us to start with. I want you to take out a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. And uh, so get those ready. And then when you come back, I just want you to put like three dots across the top and then three dots down and fill in all of them. So by the end, you'll have nine dots, okay? So uh, get your piece of paper, get your pen, your pencil, and uh, put those dots on a piece of paper. And then I'm going to tell you what to do, okay? So we want to have a little fun as we start this message to get together today. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, in just a couple seconds, you're going to take that pen or pencil, and I want you to try to um, draw a line to connect all of the dots. But here's two things you can't do. You can't lift up your pen or pencil at any point. Once you start drawing, you have to keep it on the paper, and you're not allowed to cross over any line that you draw. Okay, those are the two rules, right? You can't lift up the pen or pencil. Once you start drawing, you have to keep going. And you can't cross over a line that you've already drawn. Okay, so it's give it a little bit and see if you could do it. Go ahead, take those dots and take that pen and see if you can connect all of those dots together. Okay, uh, give it a shot. Uh, I've done this with a lot of groups. I do it particularly uh, in a class we uh, teach on coaching or drawing out of people what's in them called 503 and you can be looking by the way for some coaching classes at, at church as we to happen as we continue to kind of really um, equip people to serve God in meaningful ways in their life. So be on the lookout for that. But anyway, how's this challenge going? Like are you able to do it? Um, are you able to do it? Um, probably not. In fact, you're probably really frustrated at me right now because you're like, this is impossible. It can't be done. How do you do it? Well, I want to show you how it can be done. Uh, and I have a little picture I want to show you. Uh, the key is when you draw the line, you actually draw the line so you go beyond the dots and then come back into the dots again. Only by going outside of the box, as it were, of the nine dots can you actually complete this challenge. Now you might say, hey, that's not fair. Uh, but I didn't actually tell you that you couldn't do that. I didn't tell you you couldn't go outside of the box. It's just we kind of naturally constrain our thinking to think that, that we have to stay within certain parameters, uh, even though we've never been told that. But here's the point. Have you ever been asked to do something in your life that you felt like could not be done? <laughs> um, uh, but it's more like you've been asked to do something that you have to think in a different way, outside the box, with a different framework to actually be able to do it. The question I want to think about today is, would Jesus ask us of, to do something that couldn't be done? Um, maybe when he sounds that way, he's actually asking us to think differently so we can do what he's calling us to do. You know, at the center of all the biblical commands, at the core of everything I've commanded you to do, Jesus said, um, is the idea that we're supposed to love God with everything we've got and love our neighbors in the same way that we love ourselves. Now, we might hear that and go, really? It, are those things even possible? Um, well, here's the amazing truth. Um, Jesus 
actually thinks we can become like him. Uh, Jesus actually believes it's possible for frail and deeply flawed human beings to have our complete affection focused on God and others. Now, the key word for me here is possible. That it's possible if we think outside the box. You know, sometimes I think we have unconsciously given up on the possibility of actually doing what Jesus has commanded us to do. No, no, never consciously thought, well, Jesus, I think you're an idealistic dreamer, or you, you can only expect so much from flawed humans. Um, I may not even actually be aware that in some level I've dismissed Jesus' belief in me. Sometimes what takes over our thoughts and our spirit in our attempt to be authentic was when we focus on where we've fallen short of Jesus' call. Um, in our desire to make sure that we weren't deceiving ourselves about our capacity for sin, maybe we gave up on the possibility that the character of Jesus could actually take over our life. Um, I want to talk about the impossible possibility. <laughs> um, because of this insight, I've come to realize that we need to hold two truths in like dynamic tension. On the one hand, we need to be rigorously honest about our own shortcomings, right? I mean, part of what it means to live in light of Jesus is to allow him to shine that light in the hidden regions of our own soul. Yet at the same time, we need to hold, in the other hand, the compelling vision that this same light illuminates our path so we can live into our potential of being um, lovers of God and lovers of people. You know, the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber suggests that we should go around with a piece of paper in each one of our pockets. On one piece of paper should be written, I am dust and ashes. And on the other one is written, for me, the world was created. Yet we're finite and broken people, as well as those who've been redeemed to reflect the Redeemer. Um, Jesus would not ask us to do and to be something unless it was possible. Um, we can become the, the bodily dwelling place of Jesus who lives out his life through us. The vision that Jesus has placed before us comes in the form of his summary statement as to what our life agenda is supposed to be about. You know, in response to one of the teachers of the law, seeking to know, you know, which of the commandments was the most important, Jesus said this, um, which we've come to call the great commandment. You're probably familiar with it. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. That's from Mark 12, 30 through 31. Um, he didn't follow up uh, this by saying, well, I know I'm asking a lot, but do the best you can. I know you'll never fully approximate this high and lofty goal, but it's worth striving for. No, no, no. We, we add that in our own thinking. Um, you know, in my spirit, sometimes I wash out the possibility that I could actually do this thing. Look, I know the guy dwelling uh, in this body all too well, and not a chance that this weak, feeble individual could ever approximate Jesus' expectation. Yet, something uplifting started to happen when my spirit began to rehearse a different message in my mind. Jesus thinks that's possible. He thinks this is possible. And, and as I thought about that, I found a new energy released in me, a buoyancy of spirit that beckoned me with the thought that, that I could live more deeply into the possibility of loving God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving my neighbor as myself. You know, with Jesus, it's possible to love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you. Um, this is not just for the rare person who seems to have tapped into a pool of grace that the rest of us have not been able to find. Um, but it will take a change in our thinking, just like connecting those dots did. So here's the paradox. Um, the paradox of being a, a follower of Jesus Christ. That we need to embrace what appears to be two competing truths about ourselves. If we're to approximate what Jesus believes uh, is the potential of being great commandment people. The irony is that living up to the potential of Jesus' expectation is only possible if we dwell in the vortex of the seeming contradiction of our deeply corrupted spirit and our redeemed promise. See, on the one hand, 
If we're not deeply in touch with our dark side, we'll miss the incredible grace that claimed us while we were in full rebellion against God and and into our own self-exaltation. Kind of like the alcoholic who starts down the road to redemption by saying, uh, we admit that we're powerless over alcohol. You know, just so the believer acknowledges without qualification that we admit that we are powerless over sin. Look, I have to admit that sometimes, left to myself, I don't love God or my neighbor. In fact, sometimes I distance myself from, dislike, or even hate God who crowds my autonomy, doesn't do what I want, doesn't explain his plan to me, and requires faith and submission in the dark sometimes. And sometimes, if I'm honest, I don't really care about what happens to my neighbor as long as I'm taken care of. Only when we see the extent of how corrupt our spirit is, through and through, will we rejoice with Paul's words. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even while we were dead in our transgressions. That's Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. Um, Without an awareness of our need for grace, we will simply turn the great commandment into a new law that we'll attempt to fulfill by our own effort. See, this is where legalism comes in, and that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, Where I try to use the commandment to earn something with God, where I try to look better than someone else or, or beat others up by how they don't measure up the way I do. (laughs) Um, The great, the the commandments were given to us um, by God to humble us, to show us our need of God. The apostle Paul tells us that the law was given to show us how far short we fall before the holiness of God. Romans 7, 13 says, in order that sin might be shown to be sin. Um, It serves its purpose by driving us to our knees. Um, I mean, just try to keep the command to love God and to love our neighbor in our own strength. Um, (laughs) We can't do it. Um, So in our study of the great commandment, we want to avoid Jesus's command becoming simply another law. Uh, Even if less in number, too, it will only lead to an enslavement rather than to freedom. On the other hand, we don't want to miss what's implied in this statement of Jesus. Jesus thinks that living this truth is possible. He wouldn't ask you to do something that's impossible. I want to give you a quote from uh, Greg Ogden. But but first you have to know uh, what what, uh, shoals are. Shoals are characteristically long and narrow, linear ridges. Um, uh, I want to show you a picture of one, okay? So now here here comes the quote. We walk carefully between the shoals of self-sufficiency by being in touch with our capacity for self-deception, yet at the same time energized by the new capacity that God's grace has given us to become the redeemed people in whom Christ dwells. The Apostle Paul, on one hand, said of himself, I am the worst of sinners, 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. On the other hand, he said that this awareness infused him with an energy and a passion fueled by God's grace um, that set him across the known world with the message of Jesus. So here's how Paul brings these two truths together. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. So how does living with the reality that we're sinners who've been captured by grace create a passion to live out the reality of the great commandment? Um, I mean, do you just think that Jesus actually meant that we could love God and our neighbor? Um does Jesus really believe in us? And how can we do this? How can we move toward this in our life? You see, it all comes down to the transformation of the will. To be fully formed in Christ is to come to that place where our natural impulses come to reflect the feelings, thinking, and actions of Jesus himself. And the will um, is the primary locus of this formation, the the executive center of our being. And there's three conditions um, or dimensions of the will. The first one is the impulsive will. 
The impulsive will is directed or moved uh, by or toward things that are simply attractive, right? Um, this is where a, a baby begins their life, right? A baby simply is drawn to what is enticing in their environment. Ad adults who don't outgrow this impulse uh, to simply do what's pleasing to them are driven by immediacy, are, are enslaved by their own desires. Um, this appears to be actually the cultural norm in the United States. Robert Bela, who's a, and a team of sociologists went in search of the distinguishing characteristics of Americans. Um, and uh, they published the results in a, a study of their work called The Habits of the Heart. And they found that there's one quality that sets Americans apart from those of other cultures. Um, it's freedom. But unfortunately, it's a rather skewed view of freedom. It's the freedom from obligation. This view of freedom can be summarized as follows. I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and no one better tell me otherwise. Now, here's what I want to tell you. Living that way won't produce a love for God or love for others because we can't get past a love for self. Bila makes the point that this view of freedom as radical independence does not provide the basis for any long-term covenantal relationship, such as marriage or even a relationship with God. Certainly not your neighbor. You know, as a follower of Christ, we have to move past this. We have to adopt the practice of a reflective will, okay? Uh, where, this is where we begin to set up a dialogue with God, where the good that God intends is examined against our thinking, feeling, and acting. There's a dialogue that we regularly, um, in, in our life, let the light of God's revealed truth shine. For example, in my life, every day I end my day with a time of prayer, and I use what's known as the examine. And my simplified version of this very ancient prayer is to ask the Lord through the Holy Spirit to take me back through the day in order to review what he would have me pay attention to. Um, think of it like praying backwards. And so my reflective questions that I ask myself and God are, Lord, in what ways were you present in the interactions and events of the day? And how did I need to respond to you? I, I ask myself these questions. Remember where God showed up today. You know, um, where was it that I noticed God? Rejoice, I ask myself. Um, what am I thankful for today that happened that I should give God thanks for? Then I ask myself questions of repentance. What do I need to turn from in my life that I noticed today? And then resolve, what am I going to do differently? So um, I ask those kind of four questions every day. And I both celebrate God's presence and, um, and also like notice where I missed his presence, missed opportunities, where I did something I wasn't supposed to do that I could bring back to him. This is what we work on actually in our discipleship microgroups. Um, uh, also in the discipleship small group that's meeting right now on Wednesdays, the reflective will. Um, it, it's on the way though to a deeper goal, which is the embedded will. And this is where it becomes possible to be so aligned with Jesus in our heart that we automatically respond in a way God wants us to. That our heart is so in tune with his heart that that his responses become ours. And this is how I apply this to myself. Suppose someone were to come to me and say something like, you know, I think you've had an ineffective ministry. You're not doing this pastor thing right. Nothing in the church is being done right. You should be removed, not just from this church, but from being a minister. Imagine this person um, didn't come to me with this information, but went behind my back and said this to other people in order to do damage to me. Now, this is not such a bizarre situation. Uh, actually, every church I've ever been in, I've had people come after me in various manners, just like I just described. So, is it possible that the presence of Jesus could have so engulfed my inner and bodily reactions that my first reaction would be to want to do good to this person who is out to get me, that I would want only what's best for their life? Um, to be formed in Christ is to say, yes, that's possible. Yes, this is what I would want my inner world to be like. 
um, that I want to be so in tune with Jesus' life in me that his embodied will becomes my will. In other words, Jesus intends to get deep down into the very core of my makeup and change me from the inside out. Michael Novak puts it into three categories, the public, private, and core of ourselves. John Ortborg picks up on these in his book, um, Faith and Doubt. And he says, public beliefs are those convictions that we want other people to think we believe, even though we may not really believe them. For example, the woman who puts on a dress and asks, does this dress look, make me look like I have wide hips? Um, and the male's correct response is, I didn't even know you had hips. <laughs> public um, figures are notorious for uttering public beliefs because they sound good right? Um, the biblical illustration here is King Herod. Um, after Jesus had been born, some visitors came from the east, we call them wise men, who told King Herod about the one who was born king of the Jews, right? So Herod tells the wise men these words uh, in the Gospels, go and make careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. That's Matthew 2.8. Now, did King Herod have any intention to go worship this child? No, of course he did not. His statement um, was made for good public consumption because it would get him what he wanted. Um, in our business life, there may be things that we know that are the politically correct things to say, we believe, if we want to be a good company person or to make money off the person we're interacting with. But inside, we know we really don't believe them. See, the great commandment can be like this to us. We say it, especially at church, right? But we don't live it. Not deep in here, though. In reality, though, it's more like we like God and tolerate our neighbor. That's a public belief. And then there are private beliefs. Private beliefs are those things we actually think we believe until they're tested. <laughs> For example, the Apostle Peter on the night before Jesus was crucified states his undying allegiance to Jesus, and he really believes it. Um, in response to Jesus saying that before the cock would crow three times, Peter would deny him, Peter says, even if all fall away, I will not. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. That's Mark 14. Now, when Peter said these words, like, I think he sincerely believed that in that moment. Um, I think he really did. Um, he believed what he said. It was a private belief. But were they his true convictions? No. No, because when the time came to stand up as a loyal follower of Jesus, he acted like he never even knew Jesus. We never truly know what our beliefs are until our beliefs are tested. I mean, we can assert in life or in death that um, our certain hope, our sure hope is in Jesus, um, that we believe that nothing will move us off of that foundation, right? We can say those things. Um, and, then, and then we might hear those frightening words, you've got cancer, or whatever, shakes our world. And it's only in that moment that we actually really know for sure whether he is our foundation. See, that moves us into the core beliefs. The core beliefs we have are the convictions that are revealed in our daily actions. Um, they're based on what we actually do. Um, these are the mental map things that we follow in life, that we always act out of our core beliefs or convictions. We will never violate them, okay, even if we can't state them. For example, we believe in gravity. We may not be, we, we're, we're not able to violate that belief. We will always act with that knowledge in mind, right? Gravity is just sort of a part of our mental map of what it means to live our life on planet Earth. If we want to stay safe, we won't walk to the edge of a 100-story building and take a step off. Um, if we want to, you know, because we believe in our core in gravity. Our actions are always the result of our core purposes and convictions. Even if we can't state them with our mouth, we live them. So my public convictions are what I want you to think I believe. My private convictions are what I think I believe. But my core convictions are revealed by what I actually do. So where does Jesus target the transformation of our convictions? 
Well, see, Jesus intends to change us at our core belief level or to establish his embedded will in us. His desire is to be so central and present in our life that we automatically respond the way he wants us to. Now, I'm suggesting that this means that um, we live in what might appear to be at first a contradiction, but it's actually a liberating paradox. On the one hand, we have to come face to face with our flawed nature and have a sense of how much we absolutely need God's grace all the time. Um, there's never a time where we outgrow the need for God's undeserved embrace in our life. As Paul says to his son in the faith, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. He wrote that in his last letter to Timothy. You know, whether it's something I've done or failed to do, um, all the time I need the covering of God's mercy. Yet, God has chosen to put this truth deep into the clay pot, the earthen vessel of my life, that being transformed in his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, which is his spirit. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. God thinks enough of us to abide in us, as flawed as we are, and then he begins his work of renovation from the inside out. Jesus commands us to love God and the ones for whom he laid down his life because he actually believes we can do it. That, that we have to think, admittedly, outside of the box to do this. But the irony is that living into God's possibility is only possible when we confess the impossibility of it. Um, that's thinking outside the box. That, that's drawing the line outside of ourselves and what we can do, just like with those dots, and depending on only what God can do. May the following prayer express our desire, the desire of our heart as we begin this journey in this uh, five-week series. Dear Father, we hear your call to love you with everything that we are and to love those whom you infinitely value. Are you asking us to do something that's not really possible? Part of us confesses that we're only weak creatures whose passion for you can only be described as tepid. We hear you want us to engage our hearts, souls, minds, and bodies in full devotion to you. And when we look at our lives, we feel that we pale in comparison to your expectation. If we're going to be what you want us to be, we will need an infusion of love that's not our own. And yet we want to live into your belief in us. As we embark on this journey together, create a sense of anticipation that you will stretch our capacity beyond what we thought or even imagine could be possible for us. We ask these things through the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Hey, as we continue this series, we're going to dare to believe that even though we're flawed as human beings, and we deeply are, that God's grace can actually be at work on the inside of us, where he causes us um, to just naturally love God and love others, that he can do that as we present ourselves to him to do that work in us. Uh, it's not a matter of us trying harder. It's a matter of letting God do the work only he can do in us. So I hope you can join us for the rest of this series as we really present, present ourselves to God and ask him to do that work in us. You know, part of the way we can do that is by celebrating communion together, which we want to do in this moment. Communion is like this perfect example of what I've been talking about. Um, the death of Christ was necessary because of how flawed I am, how broken and sinful I am. And yet in the death of Christ, there's the, there's the possibility, the potential as I trust in him, that I can be transformed, that, that my sins can be forgiven, that a new life can be infused into me, that the cross and communion holds these two truths we've been talking about today um, together in tandem. So I want to ask you to, to uh, get what will represent the body of Christ to you and the blood of Christ to you as we celebrate communion together. Um, so if you could take what represents the body of Christ um, and let's think about his sacrifice for us as we celebrate together. Jesus, um, we remember that you were broken for us. And it reminds us, first off, that we are broken. That's one of the things we talked about today in the message, God, that we, 
we hold that truth in our heart that we don't forget that we are not all that, that we are not perfect, that we are deeply flawed and broken. And yet we marvel at the fact that you entered into that brokenness. We thank you and rejoice in you today. And um, God, we celebrate your sacrifice for us, Jesus, as we remember your broken body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we eat together? You know, we also have uh, that which represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, and it's his blood, his life that was poured out that can change our life, that can forgive us of our sins, that can transform us from the inside out. Um, our hope is not that we can change ourselves so that we can love God and love others. Our hope is that as we present ourselves to God, he can change us. He can renew us, forgive us and restore us so that it becomes a part of our nature to love God and love others, um, all to his glory and honor. So I wonder in what way, as we come to this moment, can you ask God to do that in you? Um, that we come to this moment, we ask him to forgive us for the ways we have fallen short and not allowed him to do that work of transformation in us. That there's a way perhaps that the Holy Spirit's showing you, hey, in this area, you're not really loving me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or in this way, you're really not loving your neighbor as yourself. And, and as he shows that to you, to ask him for forgiveness, but then not try harder on your own, but rather present yourself to God and say, God, would you transform me so that I come to love you and I come to love others naturally because you've changed me from the inside out. Can we come to him in prayer as we celebrate his shed blood for us? God, we take notice of the fact that we need your forgiveness. Um, your sacrifice, the shedding of your blood was, was not just a story uh, that has a tragic part to it. It was a necessary part because we are flawed and broken. We need forgiveness. But there's also hope within it, God, that not only can we be forgiven, but we can be transformed. And we thank you so much for that, God. And we ask you, God, in this moment, um, to transform us. We present ourselves to you. We ask you to apply that blood to forgive us and restore us in that moment, to create within us um, a heart, a will that naturally loves you and loves others, God. Not to get to legalistic obedience, not that we're trying to earn anything, but that we're being transformed by, the, by your spirit on the inside out to the point that our embedded will becomes yours and we live it out just naturally because of who we are becoming in Jesus Christ. We remember your sacrifice. We ask for your forgiveness and your transformation now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks guys for watching today.